Let's stop it there. Who picked out the perfect... It's a big wide world out there beyond the suburbs and the beltways. Did you know there's a Maryland creamery where you can scarf down some homemade ice cream and hunt for buried treasure at the same time? Or that bovine gourmet is a lot more complicated than you might think. Don't touch that remote. Stories about the people who grow our food, along with the local buy, are coming up next on Maryland Farm and Harvest. Major funding for Maryland Farm and Harvest is made possible in part by the Maryland Grain Producers Utilization Board, investing in smarter farming to support safe and affordable food, feed and fuel, and a healthy bay. Additional funding is provided by Maryland's Best, Good for You and Maryland, Mid-Atlantic Farm Credit, lending support to rural America, the Maryland Soybean Board and Soybean Checkoff Program, Progress powered by farmers. Marbidco, helping to sustain food and fiber enterprise for future generations. The Maryland Agricultural Education Foundation, promoting the importance of agriculture in our daily lives. And by the Maryland Association of Soil Conservation Districts, the Mid-Atlantic Dairy Association, the Delmarva Poultry Industry Incorporated, the Maryland Nursery and Landscape Association, the Arthur W. Purdue Foundation, the Maryland Farm Bureau Service Company, Willard Agri-Service Company, and by... The days are long and the work is never finished for dairy farmers. The cows each produce about nine gallons of milk a day here at the Maryland Delight Dairy in picturesque Westminster, Maryland. Hi, I'm Joanne Clendenning and this is Maryland Farm and Harvest. The Dell family runs the dairy here in Carroll County and they milk 90 Holsteins and Jerseys a day. Coming up today, we'll meet an executive chef whose clients are well, you could say move by his creations. But first, we've all heard of dirty jobs. But what you may not know is that farming is a job that's downright dangerous. In fact, more than 200 people are injured on farms across the U.S. every day. That's why the number one thing on most farmers' minds isn't the weather or grain prices, it's safety. It's very dangerous, and I just, um think it's a good thing that I tell you this story and that it can help you. Once a year, in front of 60 wide-eyed children, situation. my wife came out. Joe Devilbiss relives the worst day of his life. There while we talked. It was 15 years ago that his wife Carol was killed when a tractor overturned. Um, <laughs> she loved the farm. Ever since, like Joe's been coming here to the Frederick Farm Bureau Safety Camp to prevent someone about. else from experiencing the same heartbreak. It helps me. It gives me a satisfaction of talking about it. I think it makes an impact on them. It was on May 23rd, 1999. It was on a Sunday morning. And I was hauling some manure and was going to my daughter's for lunch. And um, she come out and she said, um, you know, we got to get ready to go for dinner, lunch. I said, all right. I said, I got, I'll hold one more load. And something we did all the time, it shouldn't do it, but it happened. Uh, she said, well, I'll ride with you. And she jumped up and sat beside me on the fender. There was a little dew that morning, and as the tractor went down a hill, the manure shifted and the tractor lost traction. And it just took off. I mean, you couldn't do nothing. I was trying to guide it down the hill, and it got down the bottom. It, slid sideways, the spreader pushed it sideways, and the tractor went sideways, was sliding sideways down the hill and just flipped over. And I crawled out, I was underneath of it, and I crawled out from under it, and when I did, I found her, it done flip. Telling his story is so never easy, but as Joe speaks, he's also watching as his audience Kids ages 8 to 13 to stop fidgeting to and start to listen. He sees okay. them taking yeah. it all in, and he knows he'll be back again next year. Sometimes it's hard, you know, to do get through it, but I get through it. 
If that saves one life, it's well worth doing it for them children. I was thinking I shouldn't do that because I don't want to get hurt. Knowing that that happened to a man that's much older than me, well, I should not do that. It's that simple. I mean, I got a whole life ahead. Farming is dangerous business. Even with all the precautions farmers take, the fatality rate for agricultural workers is still seven times higher than it is for workers in private industry. It's why local fire and rescue departments hold special training sessions for farm accidents. Like when someone becomes trapped in a grain bin, the grain acts like quicksand, and without quick action, the victim could suffocate in minutes. Pull straight up. There you go. 49 and a half. These kids are learning just how hard it is to pull someone from a grain bin. It may look like a good time. 61.6. It is hard. But Farm Safety Camp is really about saving lives. We don't know how many accidents we prevent, and that's the great thing about it. I think anything that the kids can get their hands on and actually do will have the biggest impact and anything that they can see and relate to. It's going to beat you up pretty good. Um, and that's if it takes you around once and... This demonstration up. has a big Sometimes impact every that. year. That thing spinning is called a power takeoff shaft, or a PTO. It transfers energy between tractors and attachments. And it's nothing to play around with. It may seem harsh, but it's attention grabbing. Many of the volunteers here have been injured on the farm themselves, or they've seen friends or family members get hurt, or even killed like Joe Devilbiss. He's since remarried, and he says he's learned to cope. He's even found a way to get back on that tractor. But he still carries a pain with him that he hopes no one else will ever have to feel. I'm just glad to do it. I'm glad to take and uh, go to farm safety camp, talk to those children, help them. If a, someone thinks about it a little bit and it helps them out, well, that's, that's, that's all we got to worry about. I figure um, I took the hurt for a lot of things but maybe I can help them now. Farm Safety Camp organizers want to spread their message far and wide. Kids don't have to live in Frederick County or even live on a farm to go to camp. Now it's time to test your agricultural expertise. Check out our thingamajig. What do you think it is? Well, here's a little hint. It's not an ice cream maker or a blender. We'll see if you can figure it out. You can stay tuned to find out the answer. Legend says the world's first ice cream was simply grape juice poured over cups of freshly fallen snow. Not exactly a hot fudge sundae. Well, things have come a long way in the ice cream world, and it's easy to see why people are lined up in popular shops along Maryland's very own ice cream trail. It's one of the sweetest trails around. A network of eight dairy farms that also offer fresh ice cream right from the farm. Last season, we visited Pregel and Broom's Bloom Creameries. This year, we're heading further north to Keys in Aberdeen, then up to Kilby Cream in Rising Sun. At Keys Creamery, the ice cream's cold, but the welcomes are warm. It's the newest stop on the ice cream trail, owned and operated by David, Kelly, and Megan Keyes. So what are some of your unique flavors of ice cream that you have? We have Cow's Feet, which is a chocolate chip ice cream with a peanut butter swirl. Another one that's pretty popular is Goose Feathers, with, and that's cake batter fudge swirl. Oh, so it's we supposed to get questions on this. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Who named them? I did. <laughs> Just a few miles up the road in Havita Grace is where the cows live and work. They all produce milk, but some make more than others. So, what kind of cows do you have? Well, we have a mixture of Holsteins, which are the normal black and white cows that you see. Um, we also have Jerseys, um, mainly here to help produce the butter fat in our milk that actually aids in making the cheese and making the ice cream. So the different cows have different um, butter fat content or different fat content in their milk? Yes. Yep. And the Holsteins are mainly known for their milk production in general. They are the highest producing um, milk cow. 
The Keyes family has run the dairy farm since the 1950s. When David's father, Benjamin, passed away in 1971, the rest of the family kept it going. What made you decide to start doing ice cream? Well, it's something my dad always wanted to do, actually. It's the way we can diversify our product instead of just seeing the milk go out in the milk truck and take the price that we get. And now they get to see the sweet fruits of their labors. It's a good feeling to see the kids come in and put a smile on their face. It's just nice. The Ice Cream Trail Passport helps you keep track of where you've been. With an extra stamp on mine, I headed north to Kilby Cream. They milk over 500 cows 365 days a year. And they bottle their own milk. Kilby's even delivers. Or you can just stop by the ice cream shop. When we created this, this particular ice cream shop, we were trying to cater to mothers and children and time away because we all know everybody is so stressed these days. Nothing melts stress like ice cream, especially when you can try out fun flavors. Okay, so the Maryland state flag colors are red, yellow, black, and white. So, here we go. And what was the name of this again? Maryland Madness. And so which one do you have there? I have Ravenberry. It has black raspberry ice cream, blueberries, and dark chocolate bits hiding in there somewhere. Go Ravens! Exactly. <laughs> As you're savoring your ice cream, you can also enjoy a treasure hunt. Creameries along the ice cream trail also offer geocaching. Scott hey, Reed of Parkville oh, yeah. tells us Scott. how it works. Nice to meet you, Scott. Geocaching is a worldwide treasure hunt. And you use either a GPS-enabled smartphone or a handheld GPS. By entering in coordinates to a known location, you find basically buried treasure, but it's not quite buried. So it's like real... kind of this way. Oh, look. The treasure can be anything. In our case, it was a toy car. So, so you have a little boy at home or a little girl that likes cars. You take the car, you leave something in its place. Okay, so you, when you take something out, you always put something back. Yep. Geocaching ice and ice cream. A double scoop of fun on the ice cream trail. The ice cream trail has really helped. It's picked up traffic during the summer. With the geocache here, that's another clientele that we're reaching that we wouldn't have reached before. Don't miss out on all the fun. Visit our website, or Maryland's Best, for a map of the ice cream trail, coordinates for the ice cream geo trail, and a passport of your own. Now that you've gotten a taste of Maryland ice cream, you might be wondering about its history. We've got the scoop on this week's Then and Now. Maryland's ice cream tradition goes back centuries. In fact, the first official account of ice cream in the New World comes straight from the home of Maryland Governor Thomas Bladen, who served strawberry ice cream at an official dinner in 1744. But the creamy dessert was reserved for the elite until well into the 19th century, when Baltimore milk dealer Jacob Fussell found a way to bring ice cream to the masses. Fussell used his excess milk and cream to launch the world's first large-scale ice cream operation in 1851. In 1924, ice cream was so popular, its production made its way into the dairy sciences curriculum at the University of Maryland. The finished products were sold to eager students at a retail location known simply as the dairy. In the 1950s and 60s, UMD professor and ice cream aficionado Wendell Arbuckle literally wrote the book on ice cream. The 474-page textbook covered everything from ice cream's history to its molecular structure. Arbuckle earned the nickname Mr. Ice Cream. He was known for his constant tinkering with unorthodox flavors, everything from sweet potato to carrot to a healthy grass-flavored ice cream that didn't quite catch on. Today, the University of Maryland Dairy is still churning out ice cream for students with a sweet tooth. It's just one place you can find delicious farm fresh ice cream. There are many more sprinkled throughout the state. Coming up on Maryland Farm and Harvest, Al Spoler oh, finds himself on a farm so where some crackers and a tall glass of wine can come in handy. But before we go to Al, we often think of nutrition in terms of what we eat. But what about what's fed to what we eat? Mixing feed for cattle is a complex job. And getting it right is as much art as it is science.
nothing says Baltimore quite like a fresh pit beef sandwich. Here at the Baltimore Farmer's Market, hungry carnivores line up for a taste of beef barons, mouth-watering meats. What they probably don't realize is that what they're tasting is carefully constructed using a complex science known as custom feed blending. This is a, a protein base that we just unloaded five ton off of, off of the truck over here. And what this is, this is soybean meal and some other nutrients that have been put together and we, we use this in a lot of our feeds. The Farmers Cooperative Association in Frederick uses nutritional science and loads of computer technology to create custom meals for cows, chickens, pigs, and more. Plant manager Seth Burrier says, just like us, farm animals are what they eat. It's a lot like uh, human nutrition. You know, we take the best possible ingredients and we combine them and formulate uh, the, the feeds uh, to feed the animals to get the best performance out of each animal. It's a method that's not lost on farmers like Chuck Gardetto, who gets his feed from Farmers Cooperative. Here at the Copper Penny Farm in Anne Arundel County, he and his wife Nancy sell beef, pork, and chicken right from their farm and at local uh, farmers markets. Yes, we uh, try to offer a variety of cuts. Uh, this is a sirloin. And because his beef steak. cattle are mostly pasture fed, it's important that their diet is supplemented with high quality feed. Without this feed, his meat would be too lean to sell to the public. And when we look at the meat, uh, the, the way the marbling is in the meat, I think that speaks volumes. The nutrition is as important as the care and environment that we give them. So I spend a lot of time making sure that they're getting the proper nutrition, whether it's the pasture grass or the, uh, the feeds we buy at the mill. Back at the mill, Seth is carefully blending this particular feed that will be delivered to Chuck's beef cattle later today. The process starts with the computer here. Each feed has its own coat number. It measures out the micro ingredients. Once it gets them properly measured out, it'll dump them into a hopper. From there on, it's sent to a number of machines that turn it into different things. It's a nutritious mix of soybean meal, corn, molasses, and a host of vitamins and minerals. The blend is heated up and sent to the pelletizer. This is the pellet mill, and this is the machine that turns the, the mealy feed into little pellets. This is the feed comes down through here and it, it flows into here, and then we have these two rollers inside that compress it through the die, and we get these little pellets. Seth doesn't waste any time in getting the blend to Chuck's farm right away. One steer can eat up to 30 pounds of feed per day, so it's important that the feed be fresh and reliable. We're just like the guy that makes the donuts. We start early in the morning, feed is made fresh daily, and, and it's, it's delivered as soon as it's made. Even though most beef cows have similar dietary needs, there are still thousands of variables that can affect their health. Each farm is different. The quality of the hay from one farm to another can vary, and that's why you need a, a custom feed that uh, you can custom formulate for each individual animal and each farm. Okay, go ahead and do it. Turn it on. Good job. Back at the Copper Penny Farm, Chuck and his son Andy spend a lot of time getting the feed ready. After all, pigs, cows, and chickens all have very different dietary needs. So what I look for when I look at the feed, and this is from any mill that's making it fresh, you can see it doesn't look old. There's molasses mixed in with all with the crushed corn and, and you see the grains. I think if it's something that looks like I would want to eat it, it's definitely uh, good for the animals. And that's what we look for. And you can see they can't get enough of it, huh, buddy? Yeah. Just like Chuck's cattle can't get enough of the feed, folks from all over Maryland line up for a taste of open pit beef. The beef itself just has really a nice flavor to it, and we don't try to disguise that with a whole lot of rubs or seasoning or anything. It just has a wonderful taste of its own. That taste comes from quality animal feeds and passionate cattle farmers who have helped beef barons carve a niche in one of Baltimore's hottest markets. And there's no beef about it. Most of the grain that goes through the Farmers Cooperative and other feed blending facilities is homegrown right here in Maryland. Cattle can eat anywhere between 50 and 75 pounds of grain per day. But cattle aren't the only ones with an appetite. 
Beef is a $44 billion industry in the U.S. Whether you prefer a burger or a steak, hungry Americans keep it running by eating about 60 pounds of beef every year. About 10 years ago, Joyce Powell took the trip of a lifetime to France. She left with a taste for good cheese and a thirst for her new calling. Oh, and she was 75 years old at the time. Al Spoler explains why you're never too old to milk a good idea in this week's The Local Buy. People have been making goat cheese for over a thousand years, so it's really good to know that here in Maryland, the industry is thriving. It's kidding time here at Spriggs Delight Farm near Sharpsburg, and <laughs> little girls like this one and her, her friends inside the incubator, where they're staying nice and warm, are going to be able to be producing their own milk about a year from now, and that's going to be the foundation of some very delicious cheese. The artisan cheese made here at Spriggs Delight comes with a side of history. The farm dates back to the 18th century, and it's just around the corner from Antietam National Battlefield. The perfect combination for hungry history buffs. It's feeding time here. Look at these little guys go. Now, how old are these, uh, these little kids? They were born after March 12th. Oh, they're only about three or four weeks old. That's they're, right. They're going full bore and they're full of beans, I'll tell you what. <laughs> they're kind of like that the second day. When the goats are old enough, they go from being fed milk to producing milk. They gather here in the milking room once in the morning and again at night. And how much milk do they produce? They two, two quarts in the morning and two quarts in the evening. All that milk goes to good use. Joyce told me she was inspired to start making goat cheese after she tried it on a trip to France about 10 years ago. She was 75 years old at the time. Well, Joyce, we're here in the cheese room where it all comes together. How long does it take to make a batch of cheese? It depends on what kind you're making. Mm -hmm. This kind is probably the fastest. It's called Chev. It's made yesterday, sits overnight, and then dipped the next day, it mm -hmm. hangs overnight again. Right, right. And the next day it's ready to go. So, what to do with all that goat cheese? Lucky for us, Joyce had a few ideas. Well, Joyce, you've got a tremendous spread of goat cheese products here, ways of using it. And we have a couple really nice recipes we're going to pass on to you. But first, let's talk about all the different things you can do with goat cheese, starting with something very simple, just a glass of wine and some goat cheese. What do we have over here? Camembert, wonderful with wine. Uh -huh. So is the Valencia. That's that pyramid style. Mm -hmm. Now, one of the good things about goat cheese, it may not melt, but it sure is nice and smooth and you can work a lot of things into it, which is what you've done here. Tell us about this chev that has some extra goodies in it. Uh, we have it here with garlic and herb. We make one with jalapeno and chive, one with jalapeno and pineapple. And on center stage here, a real piece de resistance. This is 100% goat cheese cheesecake with cherries on top. This is beautiful. Uh, how, how much goat cheese went into that? Uh, two and a half pounds. Whoa, that's great. And the nice thing about goat cheese is it's really easy to work over with an electric beater, so you can get it really nice and smooth. One of the best ways of enjoying goat cheese is the feta style of goat cheese, which is just, you know, fabulous for a salad. It's got feta and herbs and a garlic in it and a oil. And of course, some and very the dried lovely sun-dried tomatoes. Sun tomatoes. Mm -hmm. Mind if I try taste? You sure may. Mmm, that is really delicious. Thank you very much. Now we're going to put the recipe for the salad and the cheesecake on our website, mpt.org slash farm. For the local buy, I'm Al Spoler. Joanne? Thanks, Al. And for those of you at home, be sure to check out all of our local buy recipes on our website. And while you're there, send us a comment or leave us an idea. And snail mail is okay too. You can also check us out on Facebook and Twitter for lots of behind the scenes photos. Now hold on, we're not done yet. Did you get a chance to guess our thingamajig? This is a butter churner. So before it was so easy to just go to the grocery store and buy butter off the shelf, they used to make it right there on the farm. Life on the farm is always changing and never boring. Check us out next time as we get to meet the folks who feed us. I'm Joanne Clendenning. Thanks for watching.
Major funding for Maryland Farm and Harvest was made possible in part by the Maryland Grain Producers Utilization Board, investing in sound science and smarter farming to support safe and affordable food, feed, and fuel, and a healthy bay. Additional funding was provided by Maryland's Best, good for you and Maryland. Mid-Atlantic Farm Credit, lending support to rural America. The Maryland Soybean Board and Soybean Checkoff Program, progress powered by farmers. Marbidco, helping to sustain food and fiber enterprise for future generations. The Maryland Agricultural Education Foundation, promoting the importance of agriculture in our daily lives. And by the Maryland Association of Soil Conservation Districts, the Mid-Atlantic Dairy Association, the Delmarva Poultry Industry Incorporated, the Maryland Nursery and Landscape Association, the Arthur W. Purdue Foundation, the Maryland Farm Bureau Service Company, Willard Agri-Service Company, and by 